talking about humanitarian STEM education um, uh, programs um, first, and then on um, Wednesday, we're going to talk about um, experiments, projects, okay? So, so to start out today, um, what we're going to do is look at some, uh, uh, some TED Talks, things like that, another movie, um, and um, discuss each of these. Um, I like to do this because it gives you a sense of, of on-location things. Some of, some of this has some nice on-location um, footage. Um, so the first one is, um, let's see if we can get this baby playing without... What is learning? What is teaching? 
is lots of schooling and lots of teaching the same as lots of learning? I don't think so. We had a study done by Uwezo Kenya, and they did a survey through thousands of schools all over Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania, and some of the statistics they found were worrying. They said that our national student-to-teacher ratio is 45 to 1. In some areas, it goes up to 60 or 70. They found that after primary school, 40% of our students are dropping out. And we hear these statistics, but we don't often ask ourselves why. Um, why are students dropping out? And if we analyze those statistics, we see that once girls are dropping out more than boys. They're dropping out around the age of 11 to 13. And you know, it's easy to say, well, let's focus on girl education. But you know, if you think about it, that's when girls start menstruating. And that's when they feel that, you know what, I, I don't know how to deal with this. I'm just going to sit at home for two days. So missing two days, three days of school every month, over a few years, that adds up. And the girls fall behind. And eventually they say, well, forget that. I'll do something else. Why else, is it, why else are students dropping out? One, maybe perhaps because secondary school education you do have to pay for. The second reason is proximity. There simply isn't a school nearby. And sometimes it's the fact that the opportunity cost is just too high. Parents are saying, actually, look out for those cows instead of sitting in that classroom and wasting your time. You're not learning anything. They're not seeing the value of that education. So I thought it's time now to match the gains in quantity with quality, the quality of education. Let lots of schooling, lots of teaching be the same as lots of learning. And how do we do this? Whenever we think of the education problem, there's three ways we can approach it. One is a school-centric approach. Let's build better schools, better facilities, better administrative functions. Or let's take a teacher-centric approach. Let's train better teachers, better role models, better instructors in the classroom. And the third approach, for some reason, globally, is often ignored. And that's a learner-centric approach. Let's get these <coughs> learners involved. Let's get them to say, wow, I nailed that math sub. I know I'm a dork, so I don't know if anyone else relates to that. And let's get them to say, that's interesting, and I want to know more about that. And I want to tell other people more about that. And how do we do this? And that's where something called Ibibu was born. And I said learning should be fun. When I think about it, learning is fun. You know, rote memorization isn't fun. But when you're truly learning something new, that's an empowering feeling, and it is fun. So how do we get these kids to learn? So what we did was we took the basic content from Kenyan government-approved textbooks with all covering all the topics of our curriculum, and we said, let's put it into a format that's engaging for children. And we got this little tablet. And we added animations, and games, and videos, and songs, and music. And we said, if kids have this in their hands, maybe they'll enjoy learning more. And it can be cheap, it can be affordable. So high technology, but low cost. And this is how it looks. When a student logs in with their username and password, they see all the content for the curriculum on one side, and then they've got quizzes, and games, and news news specific to where they are in the country. Stories, fictional stories written by African authors, really good for cognitive thinking and analytical skills for kids. We've got exam tips on how to perform well in multiple choice exams. And for teachers and parents, we've got a teaching aid and a parenting guide. In the, the, within the subjects, there's images, there's videos and animations. If you think about something like the solar system, and how you were taught that. If you were just to read in <laughs> black and white ink in a poorly lit classroom how the solar system works, that would be a hard concept to wrap your head around. If you were to see an image, that helps. If a teacher was in the classroom, you know, running her hands around, that helps too. But an animation is something that helps grasp uh, complex com concepts. Then we've also got quizzes. If you think about a textbook, you kind of give them to children. We don't know, A, if they're going to read it, B, if they're going to benefit from it. But from this, we're really seeing like which students, what are they performing well in? What are they struggling with? And we can see this student, this class, this county, or this our country in general, is not really understanding the concept of fertilization or of long division. 
And we look at these questions and we say, quiz number four, question number six is consistently being answered wrongly. We don't need another textbook. We don't need to publish a new textbook and print it and distribute it. We immediately push new content onto the tablet. And then but feedback. And education is something we always think of as a one-way street. But it's not. We recently um, released um, our science content. And one of the students said, well, my teacher told me to remember the planets of um, the colors of the rainbow by this little idiom. And it was so helpful. And it was something that we didn't know, and the other kids also loved. And then we said, beyond what's in the curriculum, there's other lessons we need to teach our children. Lessons about environmental consciousness, about social justice, about civic rights, human rights, about personal financial literacy, something children go through an entire education without ever knowing. And we said, let's throw that in there too. Let's make sure that we're developing um, and cultivating citizenship for the next generation. Let's make sure that we've got people who are ready to actively lead and take part in the economies of the 21st century. And why are we doing this? Um, I think often, especially in Africa, technology is tech for the sake of technology, because it looks cool. If you take pictures of kids in those horrible classrooms that are using technology, it looks really good on a website. But we forget about the learning outcomes. And so that's one of the things that's always been at the forefront of my mind, like, why are we doing this? Are we improving their test scores? That's not the be all and end all of it, but it's very important to Kenyan parents. Are we improving their critical and analytical thinking skills? Are we improving their chances of coming up with an innovative solution of their own? Are we increasing their social and environmental consciousness? Do they realize that if, you know what, if someone's house is burning down next door to my house, even if he's in a different tribe, that should matter to me. And then what can I do about it? Are we improving their IT literacy? Are they gonna be ready to work in the economies of the 21st century? This was um, one of the first times that I took one of the tablets out to our pilot school. And initially, just the two girls in the middle were um, in the picture. And every time I <laughs> pressed the capture button on my phone, another head would pop into that picture. And eventually, the entire class was gathered around this tablet. And that was their first level of engagement, of just wonder with that technology. And we know that that's gonna wear out. But that content, that culturally relevant content, has gotta keep coming in. We know that as students who learn about maths, I think the study showed that I think 30% of our students couldn't um, perform a sum like 12 divided by four. But if you told the same students who couldn't do that, and we said you've got 12 mandazis, which are Kenyan donuts, and there's four friends, how many will you get each? Half of them got that question right. So we need content that students can contextualize and relate to. And there's so much to be done. We've just launched pilot programs, we've launched a project at the library, and we've got <laughs> so much attention. We've been covered on CNN and Al Jazeera, and people from all over the world have been writing to us and saying, what can we do? I wanna offer my services as a teacher. I wanna offer my services as a zoologist, as a botany expert, as someone who can start content for you about digital citizenship and we've been completely overwhelmed. There's so much to do. There are so many schools in Kenya. When we say equitable education, um, what does that mean? There's a kid in Nairobi who's got access to a smart board and a computer lab, and they can read all about how the heart beats. But there's a kid in Dadaab who has a teacher who's been through that same crappy education system and are delivering bad content. That's not equitable education. Sitting in a classroom doesn't make it the same. So we're saying that with this technology, all children can access the same information. And then the teachers can do what they're good at. They can sit down with kids and find out what's ticking their clocks and what's not, what they're interested in, what time of the day they pay attention, when they're switching off. Maybe they're having problems, learning difficulties, and that's what the teacher's uh, role should be. And we'd like to expand. We want to see Pidimo all over Africa. And we want to create local custom animations, animations that Kenyans and Africans can relate to. So 
I know everyone's probably familiar with the saying that, you know, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. I don't know about that. I have um, a little bit of a spin on it. I'd say, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, and feed him until the supply of fish holds out, but expose him to education technology, and he will learn several ways to feed himself and the people around him for the rest of his life. Thank you very much. Comments. Anybody? Yeah. I um I don't know if this was their like primary school one that, that she was showing the examples of. I wasn't sure if it was primary or secondary, but they had religious studies in there, which I thought was awesome because I didn't get really like I went to a public school, a fairly wealthy public school, and we didn't get religious studies until like eighth-ish grade. And coming to college, I realized that the religious studies curriculum that I got was light years beyond what most other people got. Like there were people coming to college who didn't know Hinduism was a religion. So like I'm so excited to have religious studies in there because it's such a like, contentious topic right now. And yeah, it seemed like them. so they showed the symbols for um, Christianity and Islam, right? Yeah. And so I and I wonder I wonder if there's I don't know what the politics are on that. I mean, I don't know the percentage of each religion, for instance, in Kenya, and whether there's Hindus in Kenya, for instance. I mean, but, but even like a localized religious studies, just yeah. so that people understand that there's a different religion out there. Yeah. And it's not just whatever you grow up with at home. I think it's it's more important than than getting everything there. Because yeah. even the one that I got, we only went over the five major religions, but you can't. I mean. Obviously, there's more than five religions in the world, so. Um, but I still think that was really, really good. And regardless of how much uh, they put into it, as long as it's not like indoctrinating children into one religion or the other, um, as long as it's fair, I think that it's regardless Very of how useful. put in there, it's useful. Yeah. Uh, I think you learn. I think that kind of education, even if you're an atheist, it serves you well because. Um, there are a lot of religious people in the world of all different religions, and that helps you understand sort of where they're coming from, a little bit at least. I know I, I can't see personally how you can understand a religion without being a part of it in a certain sense. I think it's as hard as understanding culture in some ways um, to really get it. Uh, I, I, I could be wrong, but I mean, it just. It just seems like there's so much, you know, thousands of years of history typically, and so forth. But yeah, it's it's uh, that's an important part of culture, really. Understanding. Yes, was there another? Yes. I was just going to say that um, I know we've talked in the class about how um, it's really important to first see the needs of the people that like, um, you have. And I thought it was interesting how she said that like when she visited, this is what she saw, and I also thought that what she saw was fascinating because it shows what she's being really prioritized in the schools at the moment. But I just thought it was good that we still got to hear that she went there and visited first before trying to determine a solution to their needs. Her her lang her English was seemed pretty uh, Midwestern. Um <laughs> yeah I, so I don't know where she learned the the English but um I wonder if she was from Kenya, she from said, Nairobi. She said she was from Kenya. Yeah so but somehow she got that really good English. Um, but yeah, being being a local matters a lot. You come to understand it doesn't just because you're from a country though doesn't mean you understand some parts of your your own country, right? I mean that's just like we don't. Um, I mean Americans, I, I often don't understand American poverty because they, the most they see it is. When they drive through the bad neighborhood, or when they see the homeless guy out on High Street, or you know, but there's a lot more to it than that in this country that people don't understand. Just go visit Harlan, Kentucky, and you you, you know you see what I mean. Um, so so um, yeah, she, she seemed to be operating 
from a position of, of needs. I, what I didn't get, I wish she would have discussed, was whether there was a company behind this. There had to have been, right? I mean, she had the name, but she didn't say, this is a company. We're a, right? Because it's a major development effort for that software. Um, that's, that's not trivial at all. So, um, yeah, I would have liked to have known that. Other comments? So I missed the intro. Thing that's supposed to be like supplementary to a classroom setting, like you still have you still go to class every day. Yes, like, yes. So, what happens? It's like it's like replace the textbook with the tablet. So, I know that I learn better when I can ask questions, and I'm like, I've tried and tried and tried. I'm in tears, help. So, like, what if some of these topics are outside of the scope of the teacher? I guess, does it kind of take that aspect away from the classroom where you don't have? that proper authority to be like, uh, why is it X squared and not X cubed, you know, or however. Yeah, I don't know how that plays out in this situation because there might be uh, competence issues with the teachers too. They may not be able to answer some yeah. of the questions. Um, and I don't know how you, it seems to me it's pretty hard to design the software. How much help does the software give you versus the teacher? Right. I, I don't know how they handle that. That would have been interesting um, to hear. Anything else? Okay, so so the next one is with um, ICT. In remote areas of developing countries, the use of ICTs can solve many challenges associated with poor infrastructure and a lack of good school facilities. But technological access is not the panacea in ICT for development. For IICD, the quality of teachers is the cornerstone of education. Their continuing professional development is fundamental to paving the way for improved learning environments and quality education. What makes an ICT program work is the willingness of the recipient, is the commitment they have. Having the capacity in the teachers is what will make it work. IICD's projects build the capacity of teachers so they can benefit from integrating ICTs in their daily work, both inside and outside the classroom. The right ICT solutions enable teachers and school staff to more efficiently manage school administration activities, to make use of the most relevant available education materials, to enrich their teaching methods, and to provide students with the right digital skill set in preparation of their future. How about saving time and resources to start with? Manual administration in schools takes time that could be better spent supervising and teaching. Thanks to our school management information systems, teachers can prepare, record and store administrative data in a simpler, faster and more accurate way. It has really saved a lot of time. We used to take two weeks after the opening of the school just to write the prepare, preparation, I mean to prepare for the, the, the classroom work, writing the schemes of work, lesson plans, and preparing the records of work for the class. But right now, we don't take all that time. We only take something like one hour or even 30 minutes. We are done with that for a whole class of maybe 50 pupils. After having acquired basic digital skills, the teacher's adoption of digital tools causes a ripple effect that quickly spreads through other areas. Teachers take the lead in exploring the power and potential of integrating ICTs into their method and practice of teaching. They start using the internet to access up-to-date information and a growing availability of online learning tools. This helps them create locally relevant content. The ICT has changed my mode of teaching because uh, I, get the, I get more interactive with the student because they can, I, I can assess more information for them. So I interact more with them and they get motivated because I bring a variety of teaching methods by using a projector, the students can assess the computer, so it motivates them and they get more interested in you know, learning. ICTs are also a valuable complement to traditional teaching methods. Through basic and low-cost ICT setups, using laptops, whiteboards and projectors in Kenya, 
or multimedia tools like videos and educational games in Bolivia, lessons become more interactive. This increases the children's interest and school attendance. Furthermore, the interaction with ICTs enables students from marginalized communities to acquire digital skills comparable to those in the cities, a process that works gradually towards reducing the rural-urban digital divide. As digital skills are cherished in most jobs and improve the relevance of schooling in any area, interacting with ICTs increases the student's chances of getting better jobs. In order to ensure the sustainability of projects located in remote and poor rural areas, it is crucial to maximize local ownership from the start. Our participatory stakeholder approach enables local stakeholders to co-design relevant ICT-enabled solutions. This begins with identifying best applicable tools and required skills for tailored trainings. To address infrastructure challenges, such as lack of broadband connectivity and electricity, IICD advises on the use of alternative solutions found in mobile internet and solar energy. Additionally, a local M&D system put in place by our partner organizations allows for needed adjustments to the project as it goes along. We had what we call the social innovation workshop, whereby we all came together, we brainstormed, and we tried to, we tried to look into various issues that affects ICT in schools. And after we did that, then we were able to come up with a very good project. Through IICD's work in ICT for Education, thousands of teachers in remote <coughs> areas can now work more efficiently, use locally relevant materials, and have enriched their teaching methods and shared their newly acquired digital skills with their students. To learn more about IICD's projects in education, go to www.iicd.org slash our dash work slash education. Um, comments. What'd you notice? You see some words from what we've talked about in the last few weeks? Concepts? Participatory development of an educational program. That's what we're going to talk about today. Same idea holds, right? It's a, it's a special case of participatory development. Yes, Tyler. So this one seemed more <coughs> like coming up with ways for the students to learn better, but also for the teachers to teach better. Yeah. Or does the first one seem more like strictly learner-based? Yeah, more student-centric. Yeah. yeah, so there's a philosophical difference. I mean, the woman in the first one was sort of say there's a triangle, right? Administration, teachers, and, and learners, as she said. Here, it, it seemed to be more centered towards teachers. Um, and the participatory piece seemed to be more centered towards teachers and administration, right? Um, some people would dispute whether that's a good idea. It's, it's natural when you're an adult to think, well, we'll come in and fix the school, working with the adults. But no, I, I'm not sure that's a really a good approach. I think it's, it's, a lot, it's a good idea to involve some students in some ways. Um, it's not clear how. Of course, it, some of it has to be run by teachers only, but not all of it, I don't think. I think finding when to get the children involved is, is an important question. Um, so... The other thing that they were talking about there, remember they used the term uh, participatory M&E, monitoring and evaluation. We talked about that. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, you know, you set something up with, you, you design with the teachers, some program, some, you know, ICT program, we never defined their acronym, that's why I tried to say it. Information and Communication Technologies, it's a very popular term, even at the UN and World Bank level, well, that's why they didn't feel the need to define it. Um, but so you, you, they do this participatory design and then you do the monitoring evaluation of the program, see how it's doing, try to improve it and, and so forth. It's conceptually, at least on an abstract level, it's very closely related to putting a water filtration system in a village. I mean, you work with the people, try to get the right thing, 
you monitor, evaluate, try to improve, right? You know, it's, it's, it's a pretty, um, you know, close concept, broadly speaking. It's just an educational um, uh, program. Other comments? This appears to be a company, okay? That's trying to sell worldwide. You, they mentioned not just Africa, but Bolivia. Um, so, you know, there's, there's money to be made here too. Um, could be a social business. Um, we'll come back to that here in a little bit. Any other comments before I go to the third? Okay, so there's difference in character between those two. That's interesting. This one's different yet. So let's give it a shot. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll tell you about now. Started actually in 1995 when I was traveling in Kenya and Tanzania on a safari. Uh, when you're on safari, you see a lot of animals, zebras, wild beasts, elephants, etc. But you also meet with people. Uh, people who are nice and who are very poor generally and uh, if you want if you're a bit curious you can learn much more uh, when we reached the Mount Meru, the Mount Meru hotel in Arusha in Tanzania we found that the elevator was down we could not use the elevators so we went to reception and say how come the elevator is not working well they say we're waiting for someone to Germ from Germany from Siemens to come in and repair the elevators. Okay. A few hours later, I went down to the reception and I wanted to uh, ask for a um, uh, fax that I was waiting for from my secretary and say, sorry, the uh, telephone system is down. We are waiting for someone from Alcatel, from France, to come and fix it. Uh, you don't have any technicians here to fix the uh, telephone system to say, no, sorry, we don't have such technicians. So I could not get my faxes. So that's the type of things you find when you're traveling throughout developing countries like Tanzania, who is one of the most uh, poor countries in the world. But also there are some much more important things uh, that are uh, r r dealing with the economy. For example, this production line is producing bottles of beer. But when this production line stops and there's no one to repair it on site, it means 150,000 bottles of beer not produced because they have to wait for three days until a technician from South Africa comes and fix it. You can imagine the big loss that this is for the economy, for the company, and the big loss in profit as well. But it's more than that. If you go to visit a hospital, for example, in the corridors, you will find a medical equipment sitting there, sometimes with dust on it, and it is not working, it's not being used. It's been donated by an NGO somehow, or a government organization, and it's sitting there because it failed at some certain point in time, and there was no technician to repair it. The people are just waiting for uh, the NGO to bring another one. That's it. So wherever you do, wherever you go, sorry, whatever you want to do and repair or maintain, you find a problem. There is no, very often there is no local technical competences. And this is a big, big problem. So we said to ourselves, why? How come these people don't have technicians to fix those equipments, to install those equipments, to maintain those equipments? And what we found by meeting with different institutions, technical institutes, universities, etc., what we learn is that the technical education is theory-based. This means that if you go to a technical uh, institute, you'll find a teacher in the classroom saying, A, B, C, D, please repeat, kind of. And that's what they do. But there is, this is teacher-centered, but there is no training equipment. In the, in the labs, no labs, no training equipment, which means in turn that they cannot do any practicals. So when they go out of the institute, they only have a piece of paper this, that says, I have a bachelor degree in telecommunications, but they, totally, they are totally incapable of doing anything for the, for, the, for, the, for the industry. So, you know, with my good friends, after we shared a few glasses of South African wine, we found that we had 
the, the knowledge and we had the experience to make a big change into this, to make a, a big change, a big impact on this problem. Uh, and the question came, what if we do, what if we don't? Okay, we found that if we don't, this is the solution, we go back home and that's it. And we remember about the elephants and the lions and the others. But if we do, that was a much more tricky way to uh, do something to impact the, the situation. So we did our research. We met with government officials. We met with uh, different people in the Ministry of Education. We met with technical institutes. We met with local industries and local businesses. And out of it, we were able to kind of design a business plan, design what we call the FTE education model, which is a tailor-made uh, education model that is targeted to, into the, to feed the industry needs. Uh, this is made of, uh, out of hands-on practicals that are student and the, uh, with a student-centered approach opposed to the uh, teacher-centered approach, okay, which means the important person in the classroom, in the lab, is not the teacher, it's the product, it's the student. Okay? So, and the, the students are staying with us three years, and what they get out of this, they have a recognized, nationally recognized diploma, and out of it, they, most, most of them, as you will see later, have, can find good jobs and good salaries and develop themselves. Now, step one was obviously that we decided to start such an institute. Uh, we, bought, we bought the land. We bought 15 acres of land, 6.5 hectares. And step two was to build the buildings, uh, build the school, 1,500 square meters of, land, of buildings. Step three was to recruit and train the teachers. Well, as we've seen, the teachers were, as we, when we hired them, incapable of doing practical. So we had to train them on two things. First, being able to do the practicals in the lab, so they can in turn train the students. So we had to train the trainer program. We also had to teach them how to be student-centered, how to focus their attention on the student. Okay, so that is the second very important thing that we had to do before pushing the green button. And then pushing the green button is, means we had a school in Tanzania. This is the main building. We called it KITEC for Kilimanjaro, International Institute for Telecommunications, Electronics and Computers. This institute has the most recent, most modern industry tested equipment. This means that our students, when they finish their studies with us after three years, they want the, the equipment they will find going into the industry, getting in their jobs, will be exactly the same equipment as they have been using in, uh, in our uh, institute. For each hour of theory, there are three hours of practicals <coughs> training, practical training. We're also teaching them entrepreneurship and we're teaching them business management so they can have the option to start their own business. After three years with us, they go for an internship of three to six months within industries that we have chosen uh, to be in line with what we've been teaching them, like telecommunications, computers, networking, industry automation. And for most of them, we offer scholarships because they are coming from <coughs> very poor families and they don't have the money to pay for the tuition fees or their room or their transportation or their food or whatsoever. So we, we are sponsoring them in some ways. <coughs> and we had to find education solutions that could be sustained, that will have a long-term impact. After we leave, we want this to continue. So instead of teaching ourselves, and then we go, nothing is left, we train the trainers. We taught for six months, we've been training the teachers themselves, so they can in turn train the students. And when we leave, they can uh, going on. It can go on, but we also have every several times during the year we have uh, engineers, teachers coming from Europe, the States, coming into the institute and they deliver new technologies, new things. So because we want all of this to be kept up to, up to date, okay. So give an example. Recently we installed uh, we 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 installed a new program which is which deals with fiber optics because there's a cable, fiber optic cable, which is now going from South Africa to Somalia. And they're going to use that. So we needed to teach, uh, 
to, to, to teach them uh, op fiber, uh, op fiber optic uh, equipment. Now that was not enough and we had to put a quality control program, very strict quality control program in place to make sure that the quality of what we are producing is best. This means continuous assessment and semester exams. This means classroom audits. This means that when every six months we have people from Europe going there and auditing the classrooms, auditing the labs, making sure that what is delivered is, is correct. And we also have individual student evaluation, which means a face-to-face -face evaluation. We take six of them in the lab and we give them a test and we soon to evaluate the quality of the product. The quality of our technician is very comparable to what we have in Europe. Okay, so most of them are capable of going through the international examinations, like the CCNA certification, for example, which is an American standard, and they pass those exams, which means that they are really at the top. Now, so far, we have only graduated 131 graduates. They're working in 62 African businesses, and seven of them have started their own, uh, uh, our own companies, their own companies. I'll give you an example. One has started his company installing and maintaining uh, solar equipment. This has provided solar energy, electric electricity, to villages all around Tanzania, or large parts of Tanzania, bringing light, bringing electricity, so they can use the mobile phones, for example, they can ha have light at night, which was not the case. You have to know that 65% of the population of 46 million in Tanzania has no access to electricity, to energy whatsoever. 65%. So, to give you this, because uh, this is a very important demonstration that you know, one technician can have a very large uh, a ripple effect on the community. What's next? Well, as the numbers you've seen are small. 131 so far have graduated after three years. We have now been eight years in existence. Uh, and this is not enough, clearly, for total population in East Africa. That is around 200 million. So how can we do more was the next question we ask ourselves. We had two options. We could replicate the school itself, which means buying the land, as we've seen, constructing the buildings, hiring the teachers, etc. This takes about two years and two million dollars. So it takes time, it takes money. We had another option, which was to replicate the model, that we, the educational model that we have developed at Keytech. So that's the solution we've chosen because it goes much faster, it's a much faster track, only nine months, and it costs, the initial cost is much lower in the range of $200,000, so 10 times less. So that's what we've chosen as the model to replicate, to scale up. We have, we've been approached by the Kenyan government, our neighbor, to do the same in Kenya. And uh, we've started a pilot project with the Kenyan government, the Ministry of Higher Education, for a pilot site that is in one of their institutes southwest of Nairobi. And this institute will start in September this year. We also have contacts in Zambia to do the same, in Burundi to do the same, and we are expecting to contact, most probably during this year, Uganda, people in Uganda and Rwanda. We are ready now to bring quality technical education throughout East Africa and possibly beyond. As a conclusion, we believe that a skilled workforce is essential to raise a country from, from poverty. We believe that technical education plays a crucial role in driving economic development. We believe that technical education is a practical chance to participate in the middle class and it leads to independence and a bright and optimistic future. And as a conclusion of the conclusion, after all, the world doesn't get better by chance, it gets better by change. Thank you. Comments?
This is part of what Sax was talking about with technological capacity. Yes, Imani. How do you fund how did you fund starting that whole project like getting the land and building the school? Like yeah. How do you, we didn't hear anything about finances. How did he manage to do it? Yeah. What did he say? Fifteen acres? Uh, uh, two two million dollars to get the thing going. I mean, it was the summer. Where'd he get all that money? He, he he didn't say, unfortunately. I, I imagine we could research it and figure it out, but I suspect it could have been something like, you know, European um, Commission or OECD or who knows. Did he have like a relationship with the government or something? Like that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know where the two million. If the two million also could have come from the government, the Tanzanian government, right? I have no idea. I, I mean, he comes there for a safari and. Yeah. Sets up a school. It's like, right? I mean, that happens in, the, in this area. I, I, I got it. What, what's your sense to, of how he presented and managed things? I mean, there's a different tone that he sets with respect to the others, right? Yes. It's very like top down. I yeah. Guess. It's, it's like it's not it's not organic at all. It was yep. very much like kind of imposed, which I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but. It's <sighs> a difficult thing, is what yeah. it is. Yes. <laughs> was he referring to the students as the products with the quality control statements? <laughs> yeah, I think he was a business person. Yeah. Business people do that all the time. Uh, yeah, I have a bit of a problem with that, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 So um, I think people forget what they're talking about. But yes, it was a, it, it had this tone. It had a top-down tone. Um, hires the teachers and, and and talked about their incompetence um, in at least some important respects. I'm not sure the teachers would enjoy watching this film. Um, I don't know. I mean, I I think it's the wrong way to be talking about things. Uh, but it could also have been that. You never know. He and his, he also is very centric to the person. I mean, he didn't do that all by himself. Uh, who was the team? This is what I wonder, too. Okay. Now, Ted may not, may ask people not to explain who all the team is. Just get to the point. They may do that. So he, it's not clear why he didn't discuss the finances, the team, how it all got together, whether it was a participatory project more so or not, but it did feel very much top down, right? Um, other comments? Yes. So I think in the end, all three of the things we watched are basically trying to do the same thing. Um, so like, I like to think that there's a bunch of people trying a bunch of different solutions because there's a lot of help that needs to be done and there's not just one right solution. Right. But I also worry that maybe there's people are trying too many solutions and they can't get like a few really good ones to really like, get set in stone. For example, like I guess if you look at um, just business here, you'll have a lot of like you'll have just a few like really big companies that are, are like really good at what they do. Um, like you don't see a bunch of like middle companies that produce computers, you know, you see like a handful of big ones. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is, is that, you know, when people want to try something, you know, there's a, there's a natural tendency with humans to try something different, right? Um, because why well, should I do it just the same as them? I got better ideas, you know what I mean? There's kind of a natural, not invented here syndrome, right? Um, the other thing is, is there's generally not a dictator that says, do it this way. So people have freedom, which is a good thing, too. So, it's, so these are difficult issues. The, in the, the models that work, I, I don't know which of these three sort of models would be best. It, it probably fits various situations differently. It'd be very difficult to determine what fit best um, and whether you need something different. You know, but I, I think that one of the things that you can talk about, though, uh, you can talk about some principles here. The idea of participation, that, that's very important. I don't care which of the programs, you know. Um, 
the balance between theory and practice, things like that. That's what we're going to talk about now, actually, and some of the some very basic principles um, that you you should know before you walk into an educational um, development project like this. Um, other comments before I go on? Yes, Alex. Um, so I, you know, I agree that it, it seems kind of like a top-down approach, um, but at the same time, it also seems like he's trying to evaluate this like it's a whole system where it's like industry needs this thing and so we're going to pull that out of education basically. So rather than you know, a system where the students say, hey, this is what I find interesting and so I'm going to get educated in this whether or not I can find a job there, uh, it's, you know, it's pulling from the industry, it's pulling what they need out of the work. So these people get jobs. Yeah. Now, this, is a, this last one is, is very directed towards industry. Right? This, is, this is about business. This is, remember we had the utilitarian and the transformational perspective, right? Utilitarian is like, let's get education for a job. Transformational says include religion studies in the little topic. That, there's a difference. Or transformational says focus on social justice. You heard that said earlier about social justice. Our transformational says uh, include girls and women, minorities. The utilitarian just says serve the needs of industry. Now I'm not going to sit here and say which is best. I, I, I think that, that in engineering we have a very strong tendency towards utilitarian. Very strong. I mean, you know, you're going to get the job make the money. Engineering was the last year engineer's um, highest paid BS degree. Okay, I mean, so, I, I get that. I mean, you know, I get it completely in terms of, you know, I paid for my college and, and high school, et cetera, and I had to get a job, you know? I mean, it's a reality, you gotta eat, you know? Um, so th those are difficult, th those are difficult balances. Anybody else before I go on? Okay, I'm going to do quick. So the alignments, we talked about utilitarian transformational. Breaking socioeconomic barriers in this country. I don't know if you know the history of engineering in this country, but 50 years ago, almost all men in engineering. Okay. And where did they come from? Southern Ohio. Agriculture areas in Ohio. Sons of farmers. That's what it was. That's what engineering was all about. And uh, came in, and they, they made a good living, you know, and then their daughters and sons did what? They didn't become engineers. Uh-uh. They became doctors and lawyers. So this is a socioeconomic ladder climb. There's been studies on this. Now it's different, though. Okay? Now, um, amongst the group, from, from what I've gathered, just from asking big groups of students this question, you know, the parents can be doctors and lawyers, and then there's, there's women and men in the room, and they may be, go become doctors and lawyers after their engineering degree. We're, we're sort of more enmeshed with the professions now, generationally. But in these other countries, I think there is something to breaking down socioeconomic barriers here, right? They were trying to give aid in the, the last talk to people. To get them an education, they get a good job, okay? Um, <clears throat> there's values, and then there's bottom up versus top down. You saw it come right out in the, in the films. Um, and then the abstract theoretical versus relevant practical content delivery. That term may not be familiar to you with the practicals, but that means in the university it means laboratory. Okay? And in K through 12 it means experiments too. Um, technological capacity at all levels. Um, and then question, can we do develop world STEM education for the developing world? My answer to that is simply no. Okay? However, you'll see there's some qualifications to that as we go through next lecture. So participatory STEM education development. I'm going to do a quick overview, and there's a lot of details in um, the book. You can do this at the school or university. Um, you try to identify opportunities, um, needs, and assets. A little bit of how you know was discussed in some of these films, at least, um, by the first woman, for instance. And understand context. I'm going to give a specific examples about these situations later on. A lot of stuff does matter. I mean, is there electricity there? Okay. What's the classroom setting? Um, 
<laughs> there's just there's there's really quite a few issues. The, the situation with the blackboards in the room. You imagine how noisy it would be. Um, I've been in one school that was unbelievably noisy. It's I can't believe kids can even learn. Okay, so context matters a lot. Context also in the context of the country. Is there even nearby industry to get people a job? Okay, uh, that can be a, actually quite a large um, issue. Um, and we'll talk about other senses in which context matters. So how do you come up with the program specifications? You set your philosophy. And if you're doing STEM education, which I'm going to be focusing on, you've got to ask the question whether you're going to do entrepreneurial STEM or so-called e-STEM. In Ohio, there's an e-STEM program. So you teach kids not just STEM stuff, like robotics. You teach them business models so they can sell robots, things like that. Okay? Um, you could do social business STEM. That's my own invention of a term. Um, you know, not just for making profit, but for having social impact. Or do STEM for teaching so social justice. So they pick the type. They pick what they want to do. Okay? Um, these things, this one's rather obvious. STEM education is rather obviously important. Entrepreneurial STEM is obviously important, directed towards industry. These down here differ, and especially this one's different. Okay, we'll talk, I'll do some focus on that for that reason. So there's a number of approaches. You can uh, teach the students, K through 12, for instance, or you can teach the teachers. You heard, he, he used the term train the trainers. Okay? Teach the teachers, okay? Um, you can combine, for instance, the above approaches. You could have uh, a grade six through 12 students um, and teachers at the same time in the same room, teach them all at once and have the teachers help teach the students too and thereby learn how to educate the students. Why do you want to do this? You want it for project continuation. You leave, then the teachers know what they're doing, they can keep it going, okay? Um, you could actually have older students teach younger students. We've not done that yet in our programs, but it's certainly feasible. There's a lot of instructional approaches like theory, pictures, or chalkboard, um, doing written homework at home, or hands-on experiments in class or laboratory, and, or they can construct experiments or design projects. We're going to be talking about some of those um, in the next uh, lecture. Um, usually what you would do is a pilot program after you've designed the program with the, the school you're working with or university um, and evaluate it in the context. You might implement it and then you might um, assess educational outcomes. I want to talk for a minute about instructional technologies. The ones you saw today are quite interesting. Okay, the, the woman's first talk and then the, in the ICTs in the second talk, for instance. Well, the most popular one, though, um, by far over the years has been this guy right here. This little laptop. This is called, this, here's one right here. I'm going to pass it around. Hardest thing with this laptop is knowing how to open it. This is called the OLPC. So there's 2.4 million of these that have been sent to the developing world. Um, back in, oh, I forget what year, 07, I think, I ran a capstone design course and had students designing software for this that so it could be posted in the web. Uh, you can see the pictures from around um, the world. It's a very robust, um, uh, rugged um, little laptop. And uh, you know, it's been controversial somewhat. You can Google it uh, and look at the wiki site for it. And at the bottom, we'll have critiques of the, of the program. But a lot of people really love this. Um, right now, it's still, been, uh, it's still an active program. Um, in fact, they've got a tablet. But I thought this was really cool at their website. And a cool little tablet um, going on too. Uh, I don't know what the current cost is. That one there that I'm passing around uh, cost me back in 07. I bought it off eBay, I think, for around 180 bucks. Um, that's quite expensive. In fact, that shows you a problem with this program. Let me show you what I mean. So. You can look at the critiques on the web, but the technology's caught up. I mean, cheap laptops, it's incredible how cheap laptops have become, right? Um, and the question though is with some of those laptops is are they rugged enough? I'm not sure. What, I, I, I haven't looked, about a year or two ago I looked at the cost of the least expensive laptops. Um, what are they running now, anybody know? 
It's under two hundred dollars. I know that. I think it's around a hundred, isn't it? So, so I don't know what the tablet they have there is, but technology has been biting at the heels of this program in a sense. In a certain sense, that's okay. But this thing has a lot of development. I mean, you would be amazed. You go to the websites for this. They've got not, they got wikis. They got tons of people working on associated hardware for charging, associated things that hook up to it, so, tons of software development that's being done for this thing all over the world. Um, and so it's a, it's a cute little device and uh, it's been pretty effective for people, okay? So I think, I think it's nice. So we had a number of years ago, um, gave a few of these um, to an orphanage. So um, anyway, it, I'll pass it around or you can look at it afterwards. Um, but uh, it's certain, I, sorry, it's powered down. I should have plugged it in and powered it up. Um, Okay, any comments? Sorry, I'm running. Am I running over? Yep, I'm running over. Okay. All right, thank you.